Well, hello there. This is Rick Wiggins from the University of Utah. And today we're going to talk about the fascial anatomy of the head and neck. I have nothing significant to disclose. Frankly, I really thought as I got older, the world would make more sense to me, but it seems like the opposite is happening. So our objectives, we're going to talk about the fascial anatomy of the head and neck, and we're going to see how this fascia divides the extracranial head and neck into spaces. And we can think about what normal anatomy lives in each of those spaces and see how we can make a space specific differential diagnosis based on this anatomy and those fascia layers. Now, the anatomy of the extracranial head and neck is very complicated. We often think about this as triangles from the anatomy aspect or layers, but on cross sectional imaging, we may think about spaces. And in fact, if we look at anatomy books, we can get an idea of the, the very different ways to think about all these layers and spaces and everything else. And a, a lot of the anatomy books from the 1600s and 1700s discuss the anatomy this way, like in an operating room or in a gross anatomy lab, with the sternocleidomastoid muscles and the trapezius making all these spaces of triangles around the head and neck. But in the 1800s and 1900s, we started to see articles that describe these layers as fascia layers and spaces. And I actually had the great opportunity in the early 90s to do a year of research on head and neck anatomy and imaging anatomy with program chair and president-elect Dr. Alona Schmalfus. And you may be surprised to see that she looks the same about 30 years later. So you may want to ask her, what's up with that? But we all looked at these anatomy books, and a lot of us had kind of favorites. I had my own favorites. That was Grudensky and Holyoke, these guys from Nebraska, because they had this great article and papers that came out with these line diagram cross sections through the extracranial cervical soft tissues that described the neck as these spaces and fascial slips. Now, as we looked at this anatomy, especially in the gross anatomy lab, the, every, everything it seemed like was upside down, so we had to turn it around. But I spent a lot of time on an old Mac SE 30 plus and Adobe Photoshop 1.0 cleaning up these images. But it was great experience for me because it gave me the opportunity to really think about these fascial layers and these spaces and how they separate and define the extracranial head and neck. So we have fascial layers that are around the upper digestive tract, and then we can divide up the rest of the cervical soft tissues and the suprahyoid and the infrahyoid neck. For the upper digestive tract, we have the nasopharynx up high, the oropharynx in the middle, and the hypopharynx down low. And there is a fascial layer that is around and separates this area. And we think about that upper air digestive tract as being these well-defined little areas that are especially important for tumor staging. Where we say the center of a tumor is, like squamous cell carcinoma, is very important in the staging system as well as therapy and treatment of that patient. So if we say a lesion, for example, is centered in the nasal cavity or the nasopharynx or the oral cavity, the oropharynx, the larynx, the hypopharynx, the trachea or the esophagus, wherever we think that's actually centered in the upper air digestive tract is very important for their staging. When we think about all the soft tissues that are around the upper air digestive tract, we can think about these spaces in the superhyoid and infrahyoid neck. So if I find that hyoid and I just draw a line straight across, that separates from me the superhyoid and the infrahyoid neck. And we think about cross-sectional imaging very different than we think about these fascial defined boundaries and gross anatomy and surgery, we think about triangles. But if we're looking at cross-sectional studies, CT and MRI, we want to think about these spaces. So we're going to go through and talk about these spaces, and we're going to look through it on graphics, and we'll look at how CT and MRI help us differentiate these spaces. So first we have the superficial cervical fascia. This is just a thin layer of the subcutaneous tissue that's between the dermis of the skin and the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. We sometimes refer to this as the SMAS, the superficial muscular aponeurosis space, or if you're talking to a plastic surgeon, they may describe it as the SMAS, the superficial muscular aponeurosis system. All the voluntary and involuntary muscles of facial expression and the subcutaneous fat that's around them. So they can be especially important if you're in an area where people are injecting or getting a lot of cosmesis placed within that subcutaneous tissues. But we can think about that as mostly the platysma and all the subcutaneous fat that is around the extracranial head and neck. 
So that's the superficial cervical fascia, all the sub-Q fat that is between the dermis of the skin and the deep layer of the cervical fascia. Now the deep layer of cervical fascia we think about is separated into three main big areas. There's a superficial layer, the deep investing or the investing fascia that we see here in yellow. Then we have a middle layer, the buccopharyngeal fascia, that's the pink or fuchsia here that's around the upper digestive tract. And then we have the deep layer or the perivertebral fascia that's around the vertebral body and all the paraspinal muscles at that layer. So this is a, a section in the superhyoid neck. And again, we see the superficial layer in yellow, the middle layer here in pink, and the deep layer in blue. And these cervical soft tissue fascial layers define these spaces. And some of them are kind of like tubes that extend through both the superhyoid and the infrahyoid neck. So they may direct pathology superiorly and inferiorly in that space. And if we look at the infrahyoid neck, it's the same way. So here in yellow, we see that superficial layer or the investing fascia that's around the SCM and some of the strap musculatures anteriorly. The middle layer, the buccopharyngeal fascia is again kind of around the upper digestive tract. And the deep layer or the perivertebral fascia we see around the vertebral bodies and all those perivertebral musculature. Now we see here, if we look at that middle layer again, that we see a close up of what we can call the visceral space. Uh, so that is only in the infrahyoid neck, and that's the middle layer of the deep cervical fascia and the infrahyoid extracranial soft tissue. So we've got the thyroid there, the trachea, the parathyroid, and the esophagus down low at that level, and we have the larynx up higher. Now in between the investing or superficial layer and the deep layer, or the perivertebral, we have this fat that's kind of deep to the SCM that we can call the posterior cervical space that's around there. So that's a space that's in between the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia in yellow and the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia that's in blue here. So we can think about that as all this fat that we see down low in between the SCM and the trapezius, that's the posterior cervical space. And if we have a generic lesion at that level, we can see how that pushes that SCM out laterally, pushes the carotid and the jug here anteriorly, and it's gonna be out lateral to that perivertebral fascia that's around the vertebral bodies. Now, if we have a really bad trauma patient and we have diffuse subcutaneous air that's tracking up, for example, from bilateral pneumothoraces and somebody with a lot of blood stress trauma with multiple rib fractures, we can actually see the air dissecting up around these fascial slips and into these spaces. So we can get an get a idea of where all these spaces are if we have ever see a case with a lot of dissecting air like this one. And we know that there is some variability of these fascia layers. They're not complete all the time. There's often holes. And we're reminded of that here in these cases with diffuse dissecting post-traumatic air. We know that there are connections between these spaces, but they're a relatively good barrier for things like infection and disease. So we can think about the superhyoid and the infrahyoid neck in terms of these spaces that are defined by those fascial slips. So in the superhyoid neck, we have these lateral spaces, parapharyngeal, pharyngeal mucosal, masticator, parotid, and carotid spaces. And it's our job to try to think about these and give the surgeon some idea of where they're going and what they're after. We want to help these guys before they get to the operating room understand the anatomy in a cross-sectional area. So I'm going to take this same axial T1 image without contrast, and I'm going to outline all of these spaces for the superhyoid neck. We're going to look at graphics and we're going to look at CT and MRI of this anatomy and talk about what lives in each of these spaces as we go through the extracranial head and neck. So first we have the parapharyngeal space and I'm going to outline each of these spaces here. So here's this triangle of parapharyngeal fat that's on both sides of the upper air digestive tract. It's kind of complex fascial slips, uh, but it is the parapharyngeal space. So it's pretty easy to identify. And it's especially important if we're looking at a CT to be sure we're window it so that air is different than fat, so we can see that fat at the peripharyngeal space. Now, normally there's just fat in this location, but it's important because that peripharyngeal fat is a little attachment at the skull base and goes down and dumps into the submandibular space. And we know that the submandibular and sublingual spaces kind of connect in the back to that peripharyngeal space behind the mandible. Up at the skull base, there's just a small connection at the central skull base for the parapharyngeal fat. Uh, 
And it's usually not very exciting, except if we look at how that parapharyngeal fat is displaced, it helps define the space origin of a mass in the superhighway neck. So that's very important for us. We find how the parapharyngeal fat is displaced and that helps us make a space specific differential. So now we'll look at all the spaces that are around the parapharyngeal fat. So first we have the pharyngeal surface or space here in blue. So that's part of the upper air digestive tract. We've got the mucosa, the upper air digestive tract here. We've got some lymphoid tissue, some minor salivary glands. This is really where squames live, where squamous cell carcinomas live. And that's gonna go from the skull base all the way down along the upper air digestive tract with a little abutment of the sphenoid sinus. So here's that same axial T1 image. And here I've outlined for you the pharyngeal mucosal surface or space. Now you see where it is medial to that fat. So if we have a generic lesion of the pharyngeal mucosal surface or space, it pushes that parapharyngeal fat posteriorly and laterally, helping me guess that the lesion is arising from that mucosal surface or space. Now lateral to that, we have the masticator space. So here we have part of the posterior mandible. We have the muscles of mastication with the masseter, the medial pterygoid, the lateral pterygoid, a little bit of fat. And importantly, we have cranial nerve V3 that's going through there to enter the mandible and supplying the muscles of mastication. And the masticator space has these different segments we sometimes talk about. There is a part above the zygomatic arch. So there's a suprazygomatic masticator space and there's an infrazygomatic masticator space or the temporal fossa and the infratemporal fossa as these different areas. And we see here cranial nerve V3 going through that space to enter the mandible from a valley through the masticator space between the lateral and medial pterygoid. So here's that same axial T1, and here I've outlined for you the masticator space. So we see where that is in relationship to that parapharyngeal fat. So if I have a generic lesion of the masticator space, it's gonna push that parapharyngeal fat medially and posteriorly, helping me guess the lesion is arising from that area. And again, it's very important here that we remember that we have cranial nerve V3 that's going through that masticator space that is a very important potential route of perineural tumor and a key mechanism of spread from the mandible to get up intracranially. Now, posterior to the masticator space, we have the parotid space. So we have the parotid gland here, we have the facial nerve, we have a bunch of lymph nodes that are within the parotid. We have a big vein behind the mandible, the retromandibular vein, and we have the external carotid artery branch that goes up to the superficial temporal. We sometimes talk about the parotid as being superficial and deep lobes on cross-sectional imaging by designation of separation for where the facial nerve goes through the parotid, but embryologically, the parotid doesn't really have a superficial or deep lobe that are separate embryologic on logins. We just use that definition to be separate of where the facial nerve is to a superficial and a deep lobe. And if you can't see where the facial nerve is, you can find that retromandibular vein, and we know the facial nerve goes just lateral to it. So for us, that's going to separate the parotid into a superficial and a deep lobe. So here's that same axial T1, and here I've outlined for you the parotid space with the parotid gland at that area. Now we think about the parotid as a nice little triangle here behind the masticator space, but in reality, there's accessory parotid tissue that goes superficial to the masseter sometimes along the course of the parotid duct where it pierces the fascia for that second maxillary molar tooth and goes through the buccinator. So we remember that the parotid may have accessory parotid tissue superficial to the masseter muscle, and this might be all of the parotid tissue. We might not see any in the parotid bed itself. We might only see parotid tissue here. So here nicely on the CT and on this MR, we see correlating cases that have accessory parotid tissue extending along the parotid duct. So any pathology that happens at this location can happen along that accessory parotid tissue. So we like to think about the parotid as a nice triangle here behind the mandible and the muscles of mastication, but we do have this accessory tissue in that area. So we also think, just importantly, we remember that V3 is coming out of valley to go to the masticator space. We have the stylomastoid foramen between the mastoid and the styloid process where the facial nerve is coming out and the parotid has this attachment at the skull base between the styloid and the mastoid process. And so we remember that we have this attachment up at the skull base from the superhyoid neck cervical soft tissues. And we see where that is in relationship to the peripharyngeal fat medially. 
So if I have a generic lesion from the parotid space, I know that that's going to push the fat anteriorly and medially, helping me guess that lesion is arising from the parotid space. And again, I can think about what normally lives there, the parotid gland, all these lymph nodes, parotid tissue, the retromandibular vein, the facial nerve, and I can think about what pathology happens to that anatomy. Now also important in this area, we have some spaces that are usually very boring, except when they're very exciting. One of those is the retromaxillary fat pad, especially with perineal tumor spread. We normally just have fat behind the maxillary sinuses, but we can have perineal tumor spread from the pterygopalatine fossa go down into this area or go from the retromaxillary fat pad up to the pterygopalatine fossa. So that's the retromaxillary fat pad. And we also have a buccal fat pad that is actually in front of the muscles of mastication and the masticator space. So the little bit of fat we think about between the masticator space and the parotid duct, we sometimes call the buccal fat pad. It's usually very boring, except when it's very exciting, especially with retromandibular tumors. If we have a retromandibular, a retromolar trigone tumor that may be crawling up the pterygomandibular FA, it may go up into that buccal fat pad and replace the normal fat at that location. So if we're thinking about retromolar trigone tumors, we pay attention to that buccal fat pad to see if it's involved. So that fat is kind of in between the muscles of mastication and the parotid duct where it goes anteriorly. So next we have the carotid space or the carotid sheath. Uh, this is kind of complex in terms of the fascial anatomy. All three of those fascial slips are thought to combine to make that carotid space or sheath. And we've got the carotid here, we've got the jug, we've got parts of cranial nerves nine through 12. And we think about lymph nodes being associated with this space at that level. So here's that same axial T1 image, and here I've outlined for you the carotid sheath or space. And we see where that is immediately posterior to that parapharyngeal fat, that triangle of fat in the superhyoid neck on both sides. This has an extent superiorly and inferiorly through both the superhyoid and the infrahyoid neck. And we see how in this graphic, the styloid process kind of separates the parapharyngeal fat from the carotid sheath or space. So if you ever hear this discussed as the post-styloid or retrostyloid parapharyngeal space, that's why the nomenclature some people use for this area. It, I've never liked that personally because sometimes pathology in the retrostyloid or post-styloid spaces are from the styloid process, and sometimes pathology in the pre-styloid space is technically behind the styloid process. But whatever words you're using for your surgeons, just as I said at the beginning, we have a lot of anatomy books that describe this anatomy differently. Whichever words you're using are great, as long as you're referring clinicians understand what those words are. So that styloid process we think about is separating these two spaces. And if we see a heavily calcified stylohyoid ligament, we can think about that again and running through the superhyoid neck and separating those spaces at that level. So that carotid sheath or space extends from the jugular frame and all the way down to the aortic arch. And again, we've got the carotid here, we've got the jug, and we've got lymph nodes that are associated with this area. And there is some variability. We see here in this graphic an example of kind of kissing carotids. Those two tubes may go to the midline and they may shift around, especially on Valsalva, if you look closely on imaging. If we do have a generic lesion, though, of the carotid sheath or space, we see how that parapharyngeal fat is pushed anteriorly and medially, helping us guess that that lesion is arising from that location and that space. So those are the lateral spaces in the superhyoid neck. We have two big posterior spaces that we talk about, the retropharyngeal space and the perivertebral space. In between them is the danger space. We sometimes think about this as a potential space, that usually there's not anything exciting there, but there can be something very exciting, especially if we have infection that may extend down to the mediastinum or pathology from the mediastinum that may extend up superiorly. And the perivertebral space, that blue fascia layer, the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia that goes around the vertebral body, touches the transverse process on both sides and goes back around the spinous process in that musculature. When it touches the transverse process, it kind of divides up the perivertebral space into a prevertebral portion with those anterior prevertebral muscles and a paraspinal portion with the posterior musculature in the back. If we look closely at this anatomy, we see that there are fascial layers that define this area. So if we zoom in here, we see these fascial slips that are between the airway and between the vertebral body. 
So is this behind the airway? Yes, that is kind of retropharyngeal. And is this in front of the vertebral body? Yes, that is pre-vertebral in that sense, but we can define these spaces a little bit better. We have the retropharyngeal space, the space that is behind the upper air digestive tract, and we have the danger space, that potential space back behind it where there's a little bit of fat. In between those two spaces, we think about the alar fascia layer, the slip of fascia that separates them at this location. So again, we have the middle layer of the deep cervical fascia here in purple, the buccopharyngeal fascia that's around the upper digestive tract. Then we have the perivertebral fascia that's around the vertebral body and its musculature. The alar fascia goes in between those two and goes over to kind of touch or go near the carotid sheath or space. And that separates the retropharyngeal space from the danger space. And we remember that danger space somewhere around T3 has a trap door where pathology, especially retropharyngeal abscess, may extend down into the mediastinum or disease from the mediastinum may extend up. So the retropharyngeal space in front of that alar fascia goes down from the skull base and somewhere around T3 where that trap door is, we think about uh, that stopping at that level, the retropharyngeal space. So we have a difference in that retropharyngeal space of the superhyoid neck, where we think about fat and lymph nodes, and the infrahyoid space, where we pretty much just have fat, usually at that location. So the retropharyngeal space below the hyoid is just fat, but above the hyoid, we can have fat and lymph nodes. These lymph nodes are very important in some pathology, especially nasopharyngeal carcinoma and thyroid with differentiated thyroid carcinoma, which pays no attention to the normal lymphatic drainage we think about with squamous cell carcinomas that are generally moving down and towards the heart. So here's that same axial T1 image, and here I've outlined for you that retropharyngeal space. So we have this space that is posterior to the airway, and it is in front of the vertebral body, but we can differentiate sometimes what is retropharyngeal and what is prevertebral in that sense if we think about these fascia layers. So that trap door somewhere around T3 is a very important conduit potentially for infection. But remember these lymph nodes that may show up in the superhyoid neck and the retropharyngeal space. So if I have a generic lesion of the retropharyngeal space, I see where that is in relationship to the longus coli and capitis musculature, those muscles that are in front of the vertebral bodies, it's gonna be in front of those vertebral bodies. So that helps me define this space as the retropharyngeal space. So next we have the perivertebral space. And again, we think about this as having different portions, a prevertebral portion in front of the vertebral body and a paraspinal portion posterior to the vertebral body. To the surgeons, this is the carpet. It's very important for the posterior wall of the upper air digestive tract if we have tumors there that we think are invading in that prevertebral space. That is the carpet to the surgeons. And if it's invading that space, it may not be a very good surgical candidate anymore. So it's our job to try to tell them if we think tumor has invaded the prevertebral portion of the perivertebral space. And again, we think about this a little bit differently in the superhyoid neck versus the infrahyoid neck. In the superhyoid neck, we think about those few muscles that are in front of the vertebral body and the large bulky muscles posterior to the vertebral body. But in the infrahyoid neck, we have the brachial plexus coming out in between the anterior and the middle scalene, the little phrenic nerve and that musculature at that level. So when we think about differentiating these spaces, we remember that those fascial slips kind of go around the vertebral body of that musculature and the superhyoid neck, but we see that the prevertebral portion looks a little bit larger with the brachial plexus and the scalene musculature and the infrahyoid neck when we think about the perivertebral space. So in the superhyoid neck, we think about the prevertebral portion as mostly the prevertebral muscles and part of the vertebral body and, and the vessels, with the posterior portion, the paraspinal portion, is just the paraspinal muscles and the posterior elements of the vertebral body itself. But if we go down in the prevertebral portion in the infrahyoid neck, there's going to be more soft tissue here at that level. We're going to include the scalene muscles, the brachial plexus, and that little phrenic nerve that's sitting on top of them at that area. So the prevertebral portion of the perivertebral space is larger in the infrahyoid neck than it is in the superhyoid neck. Now, if I have a generic lesion of the perivertebral space, 
Again, I can find that longus coli or capitis musculature, and I see how it's lifted away from the vertebra bodies in this graphic and the correlating case, helping me guess that this lesion is arising from the perivertebral space, not the retropharyngeal space. So we have all these fascia layers that are in the superhyoid and the infrahyoid neck. And we can think about in the superhyoid neck, we have these lateral spaces and we have the posterior spaces. The lateral spaces are all around that peripharyngeal fat. And we remember again, the masticator space has a suprazygomatic masticator space and an infrazygomatic masticator space. So we have some spaces that are directed like tubes in both the superhyoid and the infrahyoid neck. So we have the carotid space, that retropharyngeal space, and the danger space, as well as the perivertebral space and the posterior cervical, kind of the space we think about between the superficial layer of the deep cervical fascia or the investing fascia and the perivertebral or the deep layer of the deep cervical fascia. That is the posterior cervical space. So when we do have a lesion of the superhyoid neck, we think about its effect on the peripharyngeal fat, and that helps us assign a space of origin. And then we can make a space-specific differential based on what pathology happens to that anatomy. So for each superhyoid neck mass, I'm going to think about where the peripharyngeal fat is normally. And if the lesion looks like it's arising from the pharyngeal mucosal surface or space, it's going to push that fat laterally and posteriorly. If the lesion is arising from the masticator space, it pushes that fat posteriorly and medially. If it's arising from the parotid space, it pushes the fat medially and a little bit anteriorly. And if the lesion is arising from the carotid sheath or space, then it pushes that peripharyngeal fat anteriorly. So I can find the fat, I can think about how it's displaced, then I assign a space origin of the lesion, and I can make a space-specific differential based on the imaging characteristics and I think about what pathology normally happens to that anatomy. Same thing in the posterior superhighway neck. I can find the longus coli and capitis complex and think about how it's affected by the pathology to help me guess that space area. So I think about it like on this axial CT, and I, again, I want to window it so that air is different than fat, so I can see where there's air and where there's fat. So it's important to start looking at a soft tissue neck CT with the window level something like 440. But I find that fat in front of the vertebral bodies, the longus coli and capitis musculature. And if a lesion is in the retropharyngeal space, it's going to be in front of that fat and may flatten it or push it posteriorly. And if a lesion is arising from the perivertebral space, it's going to lift that musculature away from the vertebral body, helping me guess that that is in the perivertebral space. So there's a separate area, prevertebral is going to be behind or inside of that musculature retropharyngeal space is going to be in front of that musculature. That's how we can distinguish those areas. So when I think about these cervical fascial layers and those fascial slips that define the neck into spaces, I don't personally think it's so important to memorize the fascial slips and which one has which name, but it's important to understand how they define the area into spaces. And then we can think about what anatomy normally lives in that space and make a space-specific differential based on the imaging characteristics. So anytime I have an extracranial hedonic mass, I try to think about where the thing is centered, just like we talked about in the upper aero digestive tract. It may make a huge difference if you say a tumor is centered in the oral cavity than if it's centered in the oral pharynx. It's the same with all the deep spaces of the neck that are around the upper aero digestive tract. I'm going to think about how the mass interacts with either the peripharyngeal fat or the longus coli and capitis musculature. Then I'm going to assign a, a space origin to the lesion. And then I'm going to think about matching the radiologic features, either on CT or MRI, to a space-specific differential of what pathology happens to that anatomy in that space. So those deep cervical fascia layers define these different spaces. The peripharyngeal fat is very important for lateral superhyoid neck masses. We want to remember that the pharyngeal mucosal surface or space is really where squamous cell carcinomas live. In the masticator space, we not only have the muscles of mastication, but you also have the mandible, the TMJ, and importantly, cranial nerve V3 at that location. We remember that the parotid space has the facial nerve going through it, and the pes anserinus, the goose's foot, as it spreads out through that area. There's another pes anserinus in the knee, but that's not important. 
only the Pezans Serenus and the carotid space is important. And the carotid space, we remember that we not only have the carotid and the jug, but we have parts of cranial nerves 9 through 12, and we think about the lymph nodes associated with this area. And the retropharyngeal space, remember that we have fat in both the suprahyoid and the infrahyoid nodes, but we have fat and lymph nodes in the suprahyoid space. In the infrahyoid retropharyngeal space, we really just think about fat at that location. For the perivertebral space, we want to remember that those vertebral bodies are great nidises for things like tumor and infection. So we want to think about the prevertebral and the paraspinal portion of the perivertebral space and that deep layer of the deep cervical fascia goes around the vertebral bodies and that musculature. And remember that we have the visceral space that really only exists in the infrahyoid neck. So we've got the larynx, the thyroid, the parathyroid, and lower the trachea and the esophagus below the cricoid at that level. So we have a lot of different ways to think about the anatomy of the extracranial head and neck and these cervical soft tissues. In pathology and in surgery and gross anatomy, we think about triangles, mostly centered around the omohyoid, the muscles going to the hyoid and the trap. But we can think about where that hyoid bone is and separate the neck into a superhyoid and infrahyoid neck. And if we divide it up in that way on cross-sectional imaging, we can think about those fascial slips and layers in all these different spaces. And if we think about how the fat is affected, fat is your friend, it's very important in these studies. That's why the pre-contrast T1 is very important, sometimes more important than the post-contrast images. And when you start looking at a CT, it's really important to start off with a window level, something like 440, so that air is different than fat because we want to think about this fat and how the fascial anatomy defines these spaces. Think about how the fat is pushed around, and then we can make a space-specific differential based on the imaging characteristics of pathology in the extracranial head and neck. And I thank you very much for your attention in this whirlwind tour through the fascial anatomy of the extracranial head and neck. Thank you very much.